In this tutorial, I'll walk you through creating a simple model of a pen for a drawing tablet. Models like this can be used as props in animation, film, and games, or you could even use them as references for 2D art. Quick disclaimer, this video is sponsored by Autodesk. As always, all opinions are my own. Since I am primarily a 2D artist, I will try to make this tutorial easy to understand for beginners who are new to 3D, but maybe have some experience working with 2D art or design software. I'll be modeling with Maya, which is a 3D application that you've probably seen in Marvel movies and across the film, gaming, FX, and animation industries. I encourage you to follow along with me. You can download a free 30-day trial of Maya or purchase it using the affiliate link in the description of this video. You will also need either a drawing tablet with a pen that has at least two buttons or a three-button mouse to use Maya. If you're interested in digital art or 3D modeling, then you're probably familiar with drawing tablets and the pens that accompany them. The pen I will be modeling is meant to look sort of generic, so I won't be trying to make an exact replica of any particular pen. I'll start by creating a new scene. Then I'll choose File, Set Project, and choose a folder for my project. Then I'll choose to create a new default workspace. This will ensure that all of the project files end up somewhere where I can find them. Next, press Alt-B a few times to change the workspace background to a gradient. Then go to the standard modeling workspace and ensure you are in the modeling mode. I've moved the outliner and modeling toolkit from their original locations, so don't be alarmed if things look a tiny bit different on my end. These modes and workspaces just show and hide groups of tools and features, making it easier to find what you're looking for. Select the poly modeling tab, which contains some primitive shapes you can add to the scene by clicking on them. Those of you watching who have traditional or digital drawing experience may already know this, but everything you can see is made of primitive 3D forms like the sphere, cube, cylinder, cone, torus, and plane. Therefore, you can start with one or more of these forms to build anything you can see or imagine. At its most basic, a pen is just a cylinder with a conical tip. We will of course add a few more details like an eraser and a button. Click on the cylinder to add it to the scene. In the attribute editor, Locate the Poly Cylinder tab and look under History for a Subdivisions Axis. Increase that to 30 to make the cylinder form smoother. Navigating in Maya requires some practice, so I would recommend watching their tutorial on that subject. They offer loads of helpful tutorials and articles that I use anytime I get stuck or have a question. If you have a drawing tablet, set the buttons on your pen to middle and right click. That will make it easy to navigate. Hold Alt and drag your pen, or hold left click. It will look like the cylinder is rotating, but it's actually the camera rotating around the object. Hold Alt with middle click to pan your view. This is like walking side to side or crouching and standing. Or hold Alt with right click to zoom in and out. This is like walking toward or away from an object. You can move objects by selecting them and then choosing one of the transformations from the left toolbar. Transformations can occur on each axis. You can rotate objects and scale them as well. Let's zoom out and scale the pen barrel on the vertical axis to make it taller. If you look in the attribute editor under P cylinder, the scale is about 10. Many pens taper a bit to become thinner nearest the eraser end. So to do that, you'll wanna select a specific part of the 3D model. If you're familiar with transforming layers in art or design applications, and you have a bit of experience with vector art, then the tools in Maya may feel somewhat familiar. I can hold right click to get a pop-up menu that will let me choose from faces, edges, vertices, and more. Or I can use the modeling toolkit panel, which I have dragged and docked over on the left. Vertices work much like they do in vector art. They are the corner points of a shape. Edges are the lines that connect the vertices, and faces are what is filled in in between the lines. Sort of like strokes and fills if we are using the vector art analogy. In this case, we want to select just the bottom faces of the pen barrel. You may have an easier time selecting what you want if you view your model straight on. You can manually position your camera or enter the split orthographic view mode. As indicated by the box in the top right, this is the frontal view without any tilt. Drag a selection that encompasses the faces, you will likely select some of the vertical faces of the barrel, so hold shift and drag a selection over those to deselect them. Now only the bottom edges of the barrel are selected. Use the scale tool to drag on the center axis to taper the barrel. We don't need the top faces of this cylinder, 
so we can select and delete those to make the barrel hollow. To exit out of editing faces, return to object selection mode. Next, let's create the conical tip of the pen by adding a cone to the scene. By keeping the pen centered in the scene and upright, it makes it easier to align all of the other forms that we will be assembling. In other words, rotate your view of the camera, not the object, while you are building it. I'll edit the cone attributes and create 30 subdivisions to smooth it out. At this point, you may want to look in your outliner, which is sort of like a layers panel. I have docked it on the right. This shows you each of the elements in your scene, and you can use it to select those objects and rename them to something representative of each component. Do this as you create each part. I'll also mention that the attribute editor panel can be useful for making precise changes to objects. You'll see a tab that corresponds to the object name in the outliner. For example, I can rotate an object 180 degrees to flip it. I'll do that to face the cone the right way. I'll also mention that if you make a mistake, it's fairly easy to undo with Control Z or redo with Control Y. I'd recommend saving periodically and saving iterations of your work so you always have a version you can go back to if needed. Let's use the Move tool to drag the cone vertically to the bottom of the cylinder. By pressing Control 1, you can isolate whatever is selected. In this case, the cone is isolated. Don't worry, Control 1 will bring everything back. I'm doing this so I can see the bottom face of the cone. Enter Faces mode and delete that face. Show the rest of your model with Control 1. You may want to return to the Move tool and position the cone so that it touches the cylinder without leaving a gap or overlapping too much. To add a bit of detail to the pen, I think it's nice to place a torus in between the cone and the cylinder. I'll set the subdivision to 30 to match the geometry of the cone and cylinder. Simply move and scale the torus into place. You may want to view the pen from multiple angles using the orthographic view mode. I'll show the top and bottom views in addition to the front and perspective. At a later point, we will use color and surface materials to separate the various components of this pen. It's better to keep things simple for as long as possible to conserve computer resources. Next, we will need to flatten the tip of the cone. To do that, enter vertex mode and select just the tip of the cone. Then use the Edit Mesh menu or the Modeling Toolkit panel to bevel it with a width of 0.1. Beveling rounds or incrementally slopes the edges of forms, and in this case, vertices. This flattens the end of the cone nicely. I'll return to Object Mode. Now we will need to create a pen nib to place inside the conical tip. Essentially, we need to make the same cylinder we created for the pen barrel, but this time topped with a sphere instead of a cone. I'll need to isolate and view the sphere from the front, then select the faces mode and delete half of it. Then move it close to the cylinder, but with a bit of a gap. We will come back to this. In the meantime, let's model an eraser for the back end of the pen. That's another hollow cylinder capped with a sphere. In fact, it's pretty much identical to the nib, just larger. So let's select both parts and duplicate the nib with Control D, then move it vertically to the opposite end of the pen. I'll flip it vertically as well. The eraser has sort of an oblong dome, so let's stretch it a bit vertically. I'll need to hollow out these forms by deleting the top and bottom faces. Next, select and combine the eraser meshes by going to Mesh Combine or by selecting it from the Modeling Toolkit panel. You can drag a selection or hold Shift to select multiple objects. I'll enter Vertex Mode and drag to select the vertices between the two forms. Then from the Modeling Toolkit panel or the Edit Mesh menu, I'll choose Bridge to close the gap. Then I'll select the gap faces and bevel them to smooth out the transition. Repeat this for the nib meshes. Now you can simply move and scale the nib and eraser into place. Many pens have a rubbery grip. That's easy to make because you can press Ctrl D to duplicate the pen barrel and then use edges mode to shorten the end of the cylinder near the eraser and then widen it a bit so that it covers the barrel. You may need to widen that torus on the end as well. In the preview pane, enabling anti-aliasing can be useful to help you see a cleaner version of your model edges. The final component we need to create is a button on the side of the barrel. The button is a beveled cube that is flat. 
So I'll transform a cube into that form. It should be about one fifth of the pin height and about one third of the width. I want to place the button on the front of the pen near the pen tip. I'll press Ctrl D to duplicate the cube and scale it larger to create a border around the button. I'll move the button to offset it enough to where it stands out against the border. Next, I'll angle the button to go against the slope of the barrel, elevating the second button a bit. The border should be fairly close to the barrel. Next, I'll return to the button and add divisions to the cube, and then enter edge mode. I'll apply a bevel to the horizontal center edge with a fraction of 0 0.05 and two segments. Then I'll select the center edge and move it inward to create a notch to separate the two buttons. Next, I will select the cube as an object and isolate it. Then I will enter Faces mode and select the Selection Brush tool. You can use this to paint across the areas you want to select. I'll select the top and bottom faces and then bevel them. You can do this on the button border as well. You may need to adjust it a bit. Next, select the button only and choose Deform, Nonlinear flare. Apply an end flare X and Z of around 0.6 and a curve of negative 0.4. This is a live effect that you can edit at any time in the attribute editor. You may need to adjust the position of the button again. Apply that same flare without the curve to the button border as well. You can play with the depth of the border to get it looking the way you want. And with that, I'd say we have a pretty nice model of a pen. All that's missing is the color and shading, which we will add next. At this stage, the model does not have any specific materials, but we can easily add some. You may want to first combine the meshes based on their color or material because the surface materials apply to the entire mesh. Currently, I have the pen barrel, the grip, the pen tip, the nib, the eraser, the button, the button border, and the tip ring. Go to the rendering tab, which shows you the various controls for coloring and shading objects. There are different types of materials or shaders like metal, glass, and matte surfaces. More goes into making a material, but these are a starting point. First, I want to choose the material for the nib and eraser since they are similar. I'll hold shift to select them both. I'll select the fong material since it works well for glossy objects. Once I select a shader, you can see the model update to become more shiny in those areas. In the Attribute Editor, you can change many of the properties of the materials, such as the color and glossiness. You may need to click the arrow to scroll to find the Shader tab. I'll make these black for the color. Next, I'll select the button center and add a Fong E material. This is glossy but softer. I'll make the color a dark gray. I'll select the button border and make it a metallic blend material that is a light gray. I'll also increase the reflectivity, but not too much. Now I'll select the grip and make it a Fong E material that is dark gray. I'll make it rougher and adjust the specularity to make it look like a soft rubbery material. If you notice the meshes are overlapping and creating artifacts, you may want to isolate the grip, select the edge, and scale it a bit larger. You may also need to move the button and border outward so it's not being overlapped by the grip. Next up are the pen barrel and pen tip, which will be a Fong E material that is a medium gray. Reduce the roughness to make these look very glossy. And last, the ring around the tip, which will be a Fong material with whatever color accent you like. I'll choose teal. The other component to shading is lighting. So let's create a couple of point lights. It helps to be in orthographic view mode to position the lights. Put them on either side of the pen, with one really high up in the sky and diagonally in front, and the other down low near the pen and slightly behind. Enable Use All Lights in each preview pane to preview the lights on your object. Just like with the materials, there are properties to customize the lighting. You can change the intensity or brightness and the color. I'll keep the primary front light white and choose Quadratic for the decay rate. I will increase the intensity to around 24,000 by typing it in. The backlight I will change to a light muted blue color and make the decay rate quadratic. Then increase the intensity until you get a nice rim highlight reflected off of the pen. 
you might want to play with the position and distance of the lights. We will need something to cast shadows onto, so let's return to the Poly Modeling tab and create a plane beneath the pen. Move it down and then scale it very large until it extends to the edges of your scene. Go back to rendering and give the plane a Lambert material that is a light gray with 0.1 diffuse. You can use this to quickly make the ground lighter or darker. Enable shadows in the preview pane. You can have the pen hovering or touching the table, depending on the kind of shadows you prefer. Move the plane, not the pen. Changing the angle and distance of the lights will affect the shadows as well. At this point, the scene looks pretty good to me, so what can we do with this? Well, on its own, we could export this as a 3D asset and use it as a prop in a game, virtual reality, or other media. I could animate the pen and use it in a video, or I could simply create still images to use as graphic assets. First, let's look at rendering a simple still image. You'll be doing this with a tool called Arnold. You can open this from the Arnold tab. You can either dock this like I have done here, or you can move it to another display if you have one. First, ensure the correct camera is selected to be rendered from. If you aren't seeing anything, or the render is really dark, that's normal. Arnold needs a lot more light than the preview does. Press the play button, and Arnold should update anytime you make a change to your model. You can start and stop this in the Arnold render view panel. Although while the preview is active, it will use up more of your computer resources. Select your primary light, and look in the attribute editor under Arnold for exposure. Increase this until it looks good. Let's say around 2.3. The Arnold render won't exactly match your model because the rendering method is different. I'll also set the samples to three. This will improve the rendering quality of the light. And set the radius to four for the primary light to soften the shadow cast on the ground. I'll set the exposure of the backlight to around two, so it isn't too strong or too weak. Now you can preview the high quality render of your pen with all the bells and whistles. Let's open the render settings. If you're having difficulty with Arnold renders, you can switch to the hardware or software modes, which will essentially render what you see in the preview. It will be less detailed, but it still looks pretty good. You can modify the render preferences to change the size and quality of the renders. They are quite small by default since previewing takes more time as the images get larger. You can also choose your preferred format. You'll want to choose TIFF for the highest quality image, PNG for a smaller image with still good quality, and JPEG if you want to compress your image to make it smaller at the expense of reducing the image quality. It's also important to note that other than the ground plane, there is no background, so that area will be invisible unless you choose to fill it with something. If I were to remove the ground plane, I could use the pen as a graphic asset without a background, so long as I export as a format that supports transparency, such as PNG or TIFF. You'd want to choose a large output size for your image in that case. There are some settings that are specific to the Arnold renderer. Under sampling, you may want to increase these by one, but not too much. These settings improve the visual quality of the render, but at the expense of making it take longer. I'll set the camera anti-aliasing to four and the rest to three. If you don't care to composite the image later, you can add in a background color to the render using Environment Background Race Switch Shader. Modify the sliders in the Attribute Editor to get the background looking the way you like. I'll undo and restore my ground plane. Now I am ready to render some still images. I recommend saving your artwork as a copy to preserve your original pen model. Then work in this new scene, where you can combine all of the meshes, except for the ground, to make the pen easier to pose. I can choose all sorts of camera angles, or just pose the pen. I can go to File Save Image and export a render from Arnold, or I can render the frame, which takes longer but gives you the highest quality. In addition to using these stills as is for graphic assets, I could also use 3D models for reference when creating 2D art, and not just objects, but characters, backgrounds, and architecture as well. Animation is as easy as creating movement and rendering multiple still images as a sequence that you play back in your video editor of choice. For example, I could animate this pen for use in video transitions or intro screens. Switch to the Animation Workspace, and go to Windows, Animation Editors, 
Time Editor if it is not already open. The timeline displays in frames just like a video editor. So thinking in terms of 30 frames per second, 3 seconds of video would be 90 frames. So press S to create a keyframe, and then move the playhead to 90 frames. Make a change to the pin position and angle, and press S again. You can also animate the camera position if you like. You can see and edit these keyframes in the graph editor. Now play back the animation, and you can see that Maya automatically fills in the frames in between. When exporting your animation, you'll want to choose a video format frame size like 1920 by 1080. You'll also want to set the file naming convention to name number extension in file output so that the sequence is in order. Set the frame range to match the duration of your animation. I'll choose JPEG for a quick example, but you'd probably want to choose a higher quality format. Then I'll export the series of images. Next I'll go to the rendering tools and the render menu. I'll choose render sequence and that will proceed to export the series of images. Before you do this, be prepared for it to lock up your computer for a while. Rendering one image takes some time, so 90 images may take a while to complete. Take a break or have lunch, or let it render overnight if needed. There's a lot more that Maya can do in regards to animation, but that should at least give you a foundation to work with. You can learn more with the free resources and tutorials Autodesk offers on their website. There we have it, a gorgeous looking pen for a drawing tablet, and it was all made possible through the magic of Maya. Check out my links to Maya in the description of this video.